Hey, welcome to the podcast. We don't, we still don't have a name, so you guys can keep on sending what you think. We have Toddcast, God. I personally <laughs> like Godcast. I there think that's go. amazing because we want God to be, you know, in this podcast. We love you guys. Today, I have Andrew Cannon, who is a personal friend of mine. Um, I've known him for years. He's an amazing witness for the gospel. Um, you can't take him anywhere without him winning souls. And that right there is everything. We love it. We love it. We love it. So I'm going to ask him just a couple of questions just to start this off and lighten things up. Um, he's, he's from over there in England, and he has a certain type of accent. And <laughs> so we go. we're going to talk about... There we go. We're going to talk about a couple of words. I'm one of them. <laughs> Is, you said is you wasn't going to do hair. this. We're going to talk about hair first. Hair. We're going to talk about... <laughs> so, okay. Okay. We're going to so, talk about the couple different... How, the, how you could say... Yeah. Things. So yeah. when I was with Todd yesterday, we were talking about air. But what I was meaning was hair. And we have air we breathe and hair as in hair the woman. So <laughs> air, air and air are all the same. <laughs> Bro, you said you wasn't going to do this. I know, but it's fun. It is fun. Half of my time with Andrew is trying to get him to repeat what he just said because I can't understand what, what he just what? said. What? what did you just say? Yeah, what like you... that's crazy. Yeah. No. Um. Uh, we love you. We love. We love Jenny. Oh, bless you. We love your wife, Jenny. She's amazing. Yeah. She's absolutely amazing. So good. But when I met Andrew, he was working for Jaguar. <laughs> Ja- Jaguar. Yeah. Jaguar. Jaguar. He was working for the yeah. car company, Jagu- mm. Jagu- Jaguar. Yeah. And, uh, and he had a great job. Oh, I had an amazing job. I was amazing a test job. driver. What were you doing? So I, w- I would be the guy who would... So when the Range Rover was built and it would hit the end of the production line, I would be the first guy to start it. What, is, what guy? The first guy. First. first. <laughs> the first guy to start the car and then we would take it onto a track. And we would test it, take test drive it. So speed, speed, oh. brand new cars belonged to someone else. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it was just to be fair. It was actually a dream job. It yeah. was phenomenal. Um, when I, I worked there for five, uh, for six years, and I don't just, tell me how you left yet because I, I want to ask you some about your job. Okay. So I worked there for six years, close to seven years, and inside that factory there was four thousand five hundred people. Yeah, it was a. So I like to look at it like this: I had the largest. I was an evangelist in the largest church in the UK. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was and my that perspective. Church was Jaguar. That church was Jaguar Land Rover. Yeah, That's where? So good. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. That's good. <clears throat> One of the things I think that, like, that when I think of Andrew, I mean, I always think of how you witness, how you mm. share the gospel. But my, I think one of the things that impacted me the most of here was hearing testimonies mm. of inside of the workplace. Yeah. Could you share some of them? Oh, I would be honored to. So when I got the job, so when I was found successful in applying for the job, we had a, a induction. Now they would employ what? an induction. So what? they would take us through the do's and don'ts when you get gotcha. into the yep. factory, yep. okay? Entry. And yeah. in this induction room, was, there was 127 people. And they went round the people saying, can you explain a little bit about yourself? So I had this opportunity to stand up and tell them that I was, I was an ex-cocaine addict, ex-self-harmer, living on and off the streets, and Jesus set me free. And from that moment, everyone in there knew I was a born-again believer. Yeah, awesome. So when I was in the workplace, People would make fun of me, but never maliciously. I could sense it was more from a place of desperation. Like, I don't know how to approach him, so I'll make fun of him. Yeah. But when I was on my own, they would come up to me and ask me, so what's going on? How, like, how about what's going on with Jesus? How, how is he real? And these kind of things. To the point where they would come and ask me to pray for their parents, for their sons and for their daughters. And one of the processes in my job, I would take the car onto what you could imagine looked like a treadmill. And the doors would close as you would drive in and they printed out a 10 foot long poster of the Last Supper. And they put it in my booth. The what, last, is, what was it? The Last Supper. Okay. So they, pitch, they posted no way. 10 foot. So every time the doors closed, I would see the Last Supper. Oh, my god! And Wade would get round at the factory. So I'd listen to this. I love it. And they would say to me, hey, bro, I've got, got some troubles. 
can I meet you in the supper room? This is in the secular workplace, bro. Mm, they would it. come up to me and say, I need some advice. Can I meet you in the supper room? And they would come in. I would pray for them. I'd pray for their parents. It wow. was amazing. That's amazing. So I love it. Yeah. Um, you used to tell me stories about like you'd have a Bible time. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. how did that go? Yeah, so we in would, a secular workplace. In a secular workplace. In the UK. In the UK. Yeah, yeah which yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I, in, in the UK, it can be quite difficult. Yeah. You know, just like the rest of the world, really. So in the workplace, at the end of our first shift, we would have a 10-minute break, and then we'd go back and do another shift. It was three shifts in one day. And what the, my supervisor would do, he would teach us, or he would explain to us what has been achieved in that day. This and many cars have been built. This many cars have been sold, so on and so forth. And he did that for 35 years. Wow. He'd worked there for 35 years. And in between this, I would say, amen. After he'd finished reading the statistics and everyone was like, what's going on? I'd go, amen. And he'd look like this and he'd do it again the next day. Amen. I'd say, amen. And all of a sudden, all my group was saying, amen. After he'd finished giving us the statistics. Or what I didn't know is my supervisor was a backslidden Christian. Oh, wow. And he had this touch from the Lord. And he said, for 35 years of my life, I've been sharing information that brings no life. He said, from today, we are going to have a scripture every day. And he would bring a scripture. And then the group over the other side wanted to know what we were saying amen to. So he, <laughs> he, he emailed that boss the scripture. Yeah. And then he would email them. And it got around the factory. And it was this resounding scripture that would go around the factory, would say this. How many people? 4,500. Yeah, but on my shift, about 1,600 people. And there was this, be anxious for nothing. The factory was going to lose a whole shift. 1,800 people were going to lose the jobs because of the sales. And there was a resounding sound. Everyone in the factory, believe it or non-believe it, was quoting, be anxious for nothing. Wow. We kept the shift. Everyone kept the jobs. That is so Amazing. Good. I love this, mm -hmm. man. Oh, tell me, uh, share uh, an encounter that you had there with an individual. Yeah, okay. So there was a guy. I'm sure uh, you've told me so many. Yeah, there's this one that, that really sticks out to me. There was a guy there, and he, he came up to me and he said, are you okay to me? I said, I'm fine. He said, you don't look with it. And I was just, I was posturing myself in my mind's eye into one of the stories in the Bible. So I must have looked quite not present. Yeah. I said, Graham, the lad was called Graham, great man. I said, Graham, I was just picturing Jesus. I said, there's a passage in the Bible where Jesus spits in mud and puts it on a blind man's eyes, and he heals him, he gets his sight. He went, no way. He said, my mother is going to have a severe eye operation in the north of England tomorrow. There's a great chance they're going to have to take the eye out. There's a no tumour at the back of it. He said, no way. I said, well, listen, bro, let's pray. He said, okay, what, are you going to pray tonight? I said, bro, we're going to pray right now. So he lifted the bonnet of a Range Rover and hid behind it when I prayed for him. <laughs> and I just said, <laughs> he didn't want anyone to know. He hid. Yeah, he hid. But what he didn't know is there was only 50 people in front and 1,600 <laughs> behind. So he's seen it all anyway. And I just said, Graham, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. And if you believe it, what I'm saying, say amen. You're standing in agreement. We pray for his mum. She kept her eyesight, kept her eye. Come on, he man. was blown away. Mm. And because he was living with oh, the reality it. of the testimony, because his mom had both eyes, yeah. she kept them. So wow. he was then living with the manifestation of the prayer, me and him prayed. Wow. And he's seen it every day. His mom had a sight. It blew oh. his mind. And we had plenty of these kind of testimonies <laughs> in the factory. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Because this is about everyday life, man. This is about everywhere you go. It's about sharing the gospel mm -hmm. wherever everywhere. you go. Yeah. So, you know, the, the modern day view of evangelists is that we're going to preach to a bunch of people mm. instead of being able to share faith in every person that we encounter. Exactly. Because yeah. the, what effect... Because I know, like, when I met you, mm. you already knew me, mm. like, yeah. through videos and yeah, stuff. Yeah, through YouTube, and I was watching tons of them. What yeah. kind of a, like, when did that impact you? Like, just the, just the videos, because we've had lots of conversations about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. How did it impact you? What did it do? Mm. 
to shift your perspective. Like, okay. Okay. So yeah. <clears throat> how it shifted my perspective is I was working in Range Rover. Okay. I didn't have what you would deem the platform. Yeah. But I seen you on YouTube doing it on the streets. And I thought, well, I have plenty of them in our city. Lots of platforms. Oh, man. I'm Every street. Every street. And then what I also noticed is it was just, oh, I'll pray for this one. I'll pray for this one. I'll pray for this one. And I thought, well, hang on. We have 600,000 people living in Liverpool. And the streets everywhere, trust me, I've slept on them. Yeah. They are there. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to go and do that. I wasn't the most confident in it, but I just thought, well, God can do this. So I just took it to the streets and I started to pray for people and I seen things happen. And it dawned on me very quickly that I can't lead anyone to Jesus without telling them about Jesus. That's right. I can't see anyone get healed unless I believe they get healed. So I started to approach them and I started to believe. Although I always believed, but then I believed I could do it in the Lord. So I just took this out to the streets and I was watching plenty of your videos and this kind of thing. And I was just inspired and provoked to the point where I was like, I could literally just be on the streets right now doing this. I'm going. Jumped in the car, drove to the nearest streets, and off we went in the supermarkets. Wow, I didn't know God could move in the supermarket until I stepped out. God started moving in the supermarket, so good, in the cinema, in a factory. And I just took it. I put it into action. I just so put good. it into action, yeah. And I've just seen great things. I love it. I need you. Mm. I need you to share your testimony. I thought that I was out of time. I looked at the timer. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Because like all this didn't happen overnight. No. But no. It, it's something like you have one of the greatest testimonies mm. I've ever heard. Mm. Just, <clears throat> yeah. uh, I cry thinking about it because <laughs> I love what God can do because there are so many people that disqualify themselves yeah. and they think, well, I've, there's no way God could use me, mm. you know, and I, yeah. I have that testimony, yeah. you know, but yeah. But when I, when I hear you share about just how bad it was mm. and the reality of that, mm. and then I see your life now, mm. you can't, there's nothing you could tell about your new life. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Because the gospel is about complete transformation. Yeah. It is not about, well, God will take me just the way I am. Yeah. It's about God will take you the way you are, but God wants to transform your life to the way he is. Yeah. Because we want to be Christ-like. Absolutely. And so... And so can you share, I don't know, a good five minutes yeah. just of where you came from, just how dark and nasty it oh, was. Oh, absolutely. Because people are watching and they're like, that guy is a great evangelist. Yeah. But they don't understand. Yeah, absolutely. So tell them about lost Andrew. Yeah. Who was lost Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. So what happened was I had a very small construction company and I was doing quite well financially, but my life just started to spiral out of control. I was meeting in the bar and in the pub every Friday, and then it would spill into Saturday, and then it would spill into Sunday, and then it would be Wednesday. So very quickly, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday. There's only three days of the week I'm not drinking. Yeah. And then that soon got filled in in the Monday. And what happened was I was drinking and maintaining a, 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 a business. And it just spiraled completely out of control. And a friend of mine, believe it or not, a friend, he asked me, had I ever tried cocaine? I said, no. He said, would you want to? I said, why not? Filled with the wisdom of the world, sensual, demonic, rebellious against God. Yeah. I said, why not? I tried it and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It started ruining my life instantly. And people say, well, how do you know? Well, I can tell you how I know. Because we only walked 20 paces and I asked my friend, for the drug dealer's number. And I call that number nearly every day for nine years. Wow. Nearly every day. Nine and it years. just destroyed my life to the point where I became suicidal. Yeah. I became a self-harmer. I had scars all over my body. I was absolute mess. Cocaine addict, alcoholic, self-harmer, manically depressed, tormented, suicidal, two suicide, failed suicide attempts, absolutely destroyed, sleeping on and off the streets absolute mess yeah. so I've been saved a little over 12 years now yeah. I met the Lord in 2010 and I moved into a discipleship center I didn't know it was a discipleship center I just thought it was a safe place to live and I moved in there in January the 18th 2010 and I was that person destroyed 
absolutely destroyed, full of chaos and the the lack of will to live. I mean, I really didn't want to live. It was a dangerous place. If I was left alone, it could have got ugly. Yeah. So I moved in this place, and on the 18th of January, I moved in 2010. On the third day of me being in there, I quite liked the fact that it was on the third day. You know, we read the Bible, and something yeah. significant happens on the yeah. third day. So we, I was in there, and the man, I'd never been to church. I'd never heard the gospel. I didn't know the tomb was empty. I didn't know there was a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And I didn't know the f uh, there was a father, a creator, who loved me. And I lived in England. No one told me. So on three days of being in there, a man walked into the room in this discipleship center. And he said, someone in here wants to give their life to Jesus now. And I knew it was me. Never uh. been to church. Never, never read a single scripture. And I felt the hands of God touch me. I shouted, Jesus, if the question. I didn't know. If you're real, save me. And I felt the hands of God touch me. Mm. He purged nine years of addictions out of me instantly. Wow. Baptized me in the Holy Ghost and in fire. And I started to pray in tongues. Damn. Todd, the very first person I ever heard praying in tongues was me. <laughs> That's awesome. Can you imagine? Yeah. Completely set free. And you just hint, you touched on something before about full Tr uh, transformation there is no such thing as partial freedom that's right There's you no. can't be half free i mean we could tie handcuff my hand to a radiator 99 percent of my body's free but yet i'm not free that's right he set me free instantly 9 15 a.m cocaine addict alcoholic self-harmer suicidal 9 16 a.m born again, washed as white as snow, brought into the right mind, forgiven, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and in his presence, baptized in love. So therefore, Amen. baptized in the absence of fear. That's so good. Perfect love casts out fear. I was baptized in his love and in the absence of fear. Yeah. And I was brought into the right mind. Then I had to go and find a Bible to read what had just happened to me. So and it good. happened in a blink of an eye because someone was brave enough to trust the truth. That's so good. Man. And it set me free. And people say to me, oh, you're still in the honeymoon period. I said, you need to get in the Bible. The wedding hasn't taken place yet. Yeah. So how can we be on the honeymoon? Yeah. The wedding hasn't happened. That's really good. This is just leading up to the yeah, wedding. This is, this, is, this is it. So God set me free. And not only did he set me free, he, he, he brought me. I married Jen, as you know, my yeah, wonderful yeah. wife. How'd you meet Jen? How'd you meet Jenny? I met Jen in church. <laughs> you yeah, did? Yeah. Jen, so the rehab that I was in was a ministry of the church Jen went to. Wow. Jen has never had an, an, an addiction problem or a drug or drink problem. So I met Jen and I, the very first time I seen Jen, I knew I was going to marry her. Wow. I knew it. I went back to the rehab and I got on my knees. I'd been saved six days. <laughs> and I thank God. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Yeah. And so I thank the Lord for my wife now. I didn't ask her straight away. There was a process and wisdom. It was like, nine days. <laughs> yeah, I waited a week. <laughs> I waited the full week to really yeah. make sure. Yeah. But I just knew. I just knew Jen. So I met Jen and two, years, two and a half years later we got married. And she's my best friend, man. We, we love the Lord together. Uh, we encourage one another. Yeah. yeah. She's wonderful, man. Mm. Um, I, gosh. Witnessing. For you, mm. is it a struggle? No, absolutely not. Yeah, but there's times, there's times I feel all sorts of things trying to distract me. I say it like this: reaching the lost is an overflow of being found. That's so good. Say that again. Reaching the lost is an overflow of being found, just like prophecy is an overflow of hearing and seeing. That's so good, man. Reaching the lost is an overflow of being found. And the only reason why you know how lost you was is because now you know how found you are. So good. And that's so it. Good. So I do feel this distress. I do feel all hell wages war and wants you to shut your mouth. But we know the truth, man. And if people don't know it, they'll never be set free. I actually trust the truth. That's right. I don't just know it. I trust it. I so trust good. the truth. He set me free. That's He's so never good. let me down and he's reliable. This is so important. I want to um, share. I want to. I want to get Andrew to share about witnessing. What does it look like? Some witnessing encounters. Um, we both came from severely lost. I mean, severely lost, and then yeah. just got found. Mm. But no matter who you are, you've you've also you also were lost, and then you got found. If you're a Christian, mm. you were found by Him. And so, <clears throat> I love this. I love all the things that He's sharing. Um, 
what could be some what could be some tools mm. for people um when it comes to witnessing i mean uh, yep. i my goal <clears throat> at, in lifestyle is to make sure that everybody can be an effective witness mm. my goal is to make sure everybody can share their faith that everybody's confident to share their mm. faith mm. um mm. yeah what would you feel some some real like what goes through you yeah, when you when you're yeah. when you're sharing with somebody yeah. or when you're approaching somebody? Yeah. Okay. So there's these three things that 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 we should all adopt. It's the message, becoming the messenger, and then the method. And what you're asking here is the method. Okay. So what I encourage people to do is tell people about your Jesus, providing he's theologically sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We don't want. No, we don't. No. Yeah. Providing he's theologically sound, tell people about the theologically sound Jesus and tell them what he's done for you. Let me tell you why. There's not a man on this planet that can share your testimony with the zeal, the conviction, and the power that you do. That's right. Because it's your encounter and your experience. Yeah. So I often say to people when you're going out and you're ministering, start like this. Hey, have you heard the good news? What good news? Jesus loves you. You lead together. You know, the, all sorts of things can happen. Or we often say this, say to someone, has anyone told you today how much Jesus loves you? Bring it, it's a question, and bring it to today. Has anyone told you, personal, that Jesus loves you today? No, they normally say. And then you say, well, listen, let us tell you. And then what we often do is, we often ask people to just listen to the others Listen to what they're saying, because so often they will give you the tapestry for you to, to tie the thread. Like someone could be saying, I'm stressed out. Well, listen, there was a time in my life, and you may not have been stressed as a Christian, but you could say, there was a time in my life where I just, man alive, it was rather stressful. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Amen. Because so often, if you want to go there and you want to start pulling 30 scriptures out off the top of your head or yeah. out of your heart. You, you yeah. just get lost, right? But yeah. you can convey that encounter. No one can share my testimony like me. No. And that's what I we tried. Did. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's my encounter, I right? Know, but it's man. blessed you. And I just say, tell people about your Jesus providing these theologically sound. Tell him, tell them how he's helped you. Tell him how he set you free. Tell them how he's helped your family. Tell them how he's helped financially, emotionally, physically, Amen. spiritually. All of these things, how he's helped you. Yeah. And that way, there's such a power on that exchange because it's convincing, you know? Amen. It's convincing. It is so That's good. That's what we teach people. We want to make it personal. We want to make sure that yeah. everybody gets a proper witness, man. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, I want to thank you for oh, coming today. It's I been love a you. I love you too. LCU loves you. We just appreciate you coming and sharing your heart, man. I'm pretty sure you're going to wit someone of the Jesus today. Come on now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate being here. Thank Love you, you so bro. much. Love you too. Man. Amen. Thanks for watching, guys.